Hello and welcome to Caring for Both, a curbside consult series by the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or APLOG. I'm Miriam Diallo, APLOG's Communications Manager, and this will be a re-upload of the third episode of a limited series podcast that we called the Post Row Review, which APLOG published right after the overturning of Roe v. Wade in 2022. This third episode is titled Reaching the Next Generation, and it features a resident, a medical resident, uh, sharing her experience as a pro-life physician in a highly charged medical environment. It's going to be a good one, so I hope you enjoy. So I'm a fourth year medical student and I got pregnant towards the end of my third year and went through application season pregnant. I had a lot of friends who were excited. So I was one of the first people they knew to actually have a baby, one of their first friends. And so they put together a small little baby shower and they had bought a lot of cute little baby clothes. And the conversation turns to application season and a few of these women were applying OBGYN and they start obsessing over the fact that there are some residency programs that don't allow abortion training. And then the recent headline was the Dobbs v. Jackson case and what was going to happen to abortion care access in America if that was overturned and what they were going to do. And it was just a very uncomfortable situation for me to be in because how do I continue to be excited about my own pregnancy when here my friends are more excited about the ability to take the lives of these innocent babies? This is the Post Row Review, a limited series podcast from the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists, also known as APLOG. I'm Dr. Christina Francis, and this is the third episode in our series, an episode that looks at influencing and training the next generation of medical professionals in pro-life issues. For reasons you will hear in a moment, this medical student has asked us to just call her Beth in this episode. The pro-life culture in medical school is pretty quiet. There's not a lot of us who are pro-life and the ones who are are kind of like me. They try to stay quiet and that's why I had asked to use a pseudonym and not be identified because you never know who's watching and what people are going to think about you. And I even hesitate to say that because I think in order for the pro-life movement to really take off, we need to be a little bit more bold. But as a student and resident, when you're being evaluated and looking at applying to these places, you have to consider that in order to have an influence, you actually have to have the position first. But then the pro-choice culture, they're the loud ones, and they definitely want you to think how they think. I gave a lot of testimony at medical societies and definitely felt rather inadequate when people would get up and say that my testimony was irrelevant or abortion is definitely health care and I have no position to be speaking that it would be thought of as otherwise. I want other medical students to know that It would probably surprise you who may be pro-life in your class. They may just, like me, not have the confidence to say it out loud or want to stay undercover about being pro-life. So you have to be creative in how you try to express your pro-life beliefs and think about ways that you might be able to elicit that information from other students without being super explicit about it, if that makes sense. Because I think there are a lot of closeted pro-life individuals out there. And I'm very passionate and excited about trying to get them involved in the conversation in a way that they feel safe and comfortable. So we have to be willing to be pioneers in that and do what we have to do to bring that to the light. The years spent in medical school and ongoing professional training are critical for forming a physician's ethical framework for their practice and exposing them to the pro-life viewpoint. That's why APLOG invests time and money into outreach for those in training. We want them to know that they are able to practice in accordance with their consciences and have legal protections to do so. I was very lucky to be protected by the conscious protection laws during my sub-internship, which is one of your most pivotal rotations in medical school. I 
sent an email to the program director and said, I do have these conscious beliefs. I will not be involved in a termination. I will not counsel a woman for a termination. And it was actually well received. He said, that's totally fine. It's not technically a requirement for the rotation. And he made sure that the residents and other faculty knew that that was a personal belief of mine and that it wasn't supposed to be a conversation. So I do have to give them credit that there are individuals who are going to be understanding of that. APLOG began as a professional association for pro-life OBGYN physicians, but over the years, it has grown to include medical professionals from many areas of practice, because the pro-life position is not just about conception and birth, it is about the whole arc of life. In Beth's case, her pro-life position made her interested initially in a family medicine career track, but her personal experience eventually led her to pursue another specialty. I entered medical school thinking that I was going to pursue family medicine. I really enjoyed the idea of from womb to tomb. But then as I went through my clerkships, I discovered a passion for psychiatry and actually ended up applying to the psychiatry match cycle. So this is even more important to me because I am now the new mom of a six-week-old. He's my first baby. And I was under the impression that, oh, you have the baby and there's this wonderful bonding of mother and child and it's just this fabulous experience and everything is beautiful, sunshine and rainbows after you deliver. Well, that is not the case. I mean, yes, there's some wonderful mother-infant bonding, but there's a lot of long nights. There's a lot of tears. Both of us cry. You know, he cries when he's hungry and I cry when I can't figure out what's wrong. It's a stressful time. And so in this postpartum period, I'm still very pro-life. I still believe that if you are pregnant with a child, that's a that's a huge human life and that it should be delivered. But I also believe that now as a pro-life physician, I have a higher duty and obligation to care for postpartum women because the mental health aspects that come into play in the postpartum period and supporting your newborn, that's huge and something that I definitely want to be involved in um, as a future physician. At APLOG, we see the mental health issues surrounding reproduction as an important pro-life issue too, especially when abortion is often offered as the solution to a troubled pregnant woman. We now have a subsection of our association dedicated to mental health, and licensed therapist Robin Atkins is the chair of it. APLOG is helping support her work on an exciting new project that will be a valuable resource to many physicians to improve the mental health care they provide for their patients. I am writing reproductive mental health curriculum and I'm more than halfway done. It's going to be done hopefully by the summer of 2022 as far as post-production too, like completely done. And I'm partnering with Life Perspectives out of San Diego, California. Their Institute for Reproductive Grief opens this month, but they have been so generous in their creating that whole structure for me. Right now, as I'm writing it, 25 credit hours. So it's really more of a fellowship, but people can choose one class at a time. They can choose to take the entire thing and get certified in reproductive mental health. They can choose just an infertility track, which is like four or five classes. They can choose just a reproductive loss track. They could choose vulnerable populations. And so one of my classes is all about populations we don't typically hear about, whether that be LGBTQ plus or incarcerated or terminated parental rights for various reasons, the disabled and parenting and how that experience is felt. And so there's lots of different options. There's also options for systems. So hospital systems or OB systems or pediatric systems to take them as a group, and there's discounted rates for that. The last class is on trauma-informed care and healing the healer. This is a track just for medical professionals. If they don't want to take the entire mental health reproductive series, they can take just the medical professionals. It's a secular program, and it's apolitical. So we don't make any political claims in it one way or another, but we do dive into all the very sticky ethical situations and all these scenarios. We dive into, for example, the ethics on embryo adoption and what about whether that child never gets to experience biological siblings that are out there and how the adoptive family might feel about that, how the child might feel about 
about that. How the fact that it's a property transfer legally really messes with the heads of a lot of my clients. Like I am basically contracting property, but it's a human being that that's really difficult for a lot of people to process through. And a really interesting thing about the law itself. We talk about the ethics of surrogacy. It's like currently and we have the war between Russia and Ukraine going on and Ukraine is a surrogacy tourism country. So people from outside Ukraine hiring surrogates at really cheap rates to carry their children. And now those surrogates can't get out and they can't get to their children. And so we talk about those ethical situations or what happens if a surrogate doesn't want to turn over the child or if a surrogate wants to terminate and the biological parents don't want to terminate or the other way around, which was just a case that happened where the biological parents wanted to terminate and the surrogate didn't. So we talk about all those difficult, sticky ethical situations. So we don't shy away from the difficult conversations. We just don't talk about whether or not they should be legal. Just want people to identify how they think and feel about them and how does that inform how they confront people who are in those situations. Next, we talked to Dr. Byron Calhoun. He is a past president of APLOG and has been a member for many years. He also pioneered the concept of perinatal hospice, something that we will look at in greater detail in the next episode. Dr. Calhoun is well known for his pro-life views and has become adept at navigating the fault lines in both private practice and academic life. I practice uh, in Charleston, West Virginia. I work with West Virginia University in Charleston, and I'm a professor and vice chair of the obstetrics department here. So I teach residents and uh, medical students and sonography students, nursing students. So I'm in full-time clinical practice and also do a lot of academic work, writing papers and teaching. We don't do uh, elective abortions here. I have not ever done that since I've been here. I think that attracts a lot of very good residents who aren't interested in that. So we get the ones who really want to be pro-life or feel they want to practice their pro-life beliefs. So we're training that next generation of physicians who are going to be pro-life. If not openly out there doing it, they're going to be in practice being you know, very pro-life. I think the real issue is to be very open to talking about all the things that go on in obstetrics and gynecology. There's a lot of things that are you know, bound up in ethics and bound up in how to treat patients and how to take care of patients. And I think the, the biggest issue that I always try to tell my residents and try to demand from them is that we think clearly and we think logically and we think compassionately about how we take care of our patients. My name is Lisa Gilbert. I am a family physician and I am in Wichita, Kansas on faculty at a residency program called Ascension Via Christi. We are a fairly large residency program in the middle of the U.S. and we train in full spectrum family medicine, meaning that we train residents to become physicians who can be in practice in an inpatient setting, in an outpatient setting. We also train in uh, obstetrics, including surgical obstetrics. And this residency program, I actually attended as a resident. So that's uh, kind of how I came to, to really know the program well. When I was finishing uh, medical school in Texas, I was looking for a program where I knew that I would be able to practice according to my pro-life convictions and according to my conscience. And this program also happened to be excellent in a lot of different areas, training in rural medicine as well as in international medicine. And so it was just a perfect fit for me to be able to come to this program. As a resident, it was uh, fairly easy to navigate conscience issues. There was an extremely supportive faculty when I was a learner, and I'm just so grateful for that. And so we're hoping to be able to continue that and to make sure that residents that do come here are able to practice according to their consciences and to provide patients with really excellent care in the process. One of the big endeavors that Applog has had lately, specifically the family medicine section, has been to produce a course for medical students and residents on conscience issues and pro-life issues. It's called Advocacy for Life, and it's available for free through Students for Life. The primary audience is medical students and residents. It's about 12 hours of recorded lecture, board-certified physicians. Most of them are OBGYN, but we have a few palliative care physicians. And it really talks about ethics, beginning of life issues, end of life issues, and sort of navigating advocacy in various spheres, whether that's within your residency or medical school, whether that's within public policy, whether that's within medical societies, and how to bring your pro-life views and, and perspectives into some of those larger audiences. 
Dr. Gilbert is both an APLOG board member and the chair of the family medicine section. We are so pleased that we now have a new course for learners on conscience and pro-life issues, as well as how to advocate for these issues, both at a local level in their practices, as well as on a state and national level. This course is an excellent way for the next generation of physicians to feel empowered and equipped to defend the lives of their patients and their ability to practice life-affirming medicine. I think I was introduced to APLOG after I attended the American Academy of Family Physicians uh, Student Conference. I believe it's the National Conference for Students and Residents. I went and was attending some of the educational sessions and found out that there were students who were pursuing medicine, specifically family medicine, because they wanted to be abortion providers. And I was kind of shocked. I was like, who goes into medicine just to do abortions? And then continued to sit in on this education session and learn that there were a bunch of resolutions being passed at the conference in support of abortion care providers and family medicine physicians being able to do abortions. And so I went to some of the resolution sessions, and this was a whole new world for me. Medical advocacy was not something I had experienced before. And then I believe it was Dr. Gilbert posted something in the Christian Medical Dental Association Facebook page about the resolutions that had been going on in the AAFP. And I was like, oh, I just saw all of this at the conference and the two of us got connected. And we actually developed a course along with several other physicians called Advocacy for Life. And with the help of APLOG, we made this course accessible to medical students all over the country, which put me in contact with even more pro-life medical students. And so because I've had that connection, it's easier to take a stand. It's easier to not feel so alone whenever people at your baby shower want to talk about abortion. So you know that you're not the only person who acknowledges that life begins at conception, and that's something that's invaluable. No matter the political trends or cultural climate, APLOG will always be focused on training the rising generation of medical professionals and equipping them with the resources and support they need to practice according to the best medical evidence without violating their oath to do no harm. We want women to know for generations to come that they will be able to find a physician or other medical professional who will care deeply and fight to defend both their life and the life of their child in pregnancy and beyond. APLOG is crucial in helping ensure this will happen so that the future will be even brighter for our patients and so that pro-life students will be able to confidently enter the medical field. In the next and final episode for this season of the Post Row Review, we will look at what APLOG's members and friends are doing to care for women who face the abortion dilemma. If you think that pro-life people only care about the life of the preborn baby and not about the lives of pregnant women, make sure to listen. I think you will be surprised. The Post Row Review is a production of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I'm Dr. Christina Francis. For more information, visit aplog.org. That's A-A-P-L-O-G.org. Thanks for listening.